And so welcome to uh, this uh, presentation on emerging approaches of uh, interoperative cardiac tissue discrimination. Uh, I will first motivate uh, why we're doing this. I'm not sure it's really necessary, but um, uh, I think you will see of, uh, for many of these slides that uh, you've in part seen already a new perspective, a more basic scientist perspective, not a clinician perspective, uh, not uh, an engineer perspective, but uh, uh, someone who worked uh, really at the cellular level and tried to understand what's uh, going on there. Uh, I will uh, describe approaches that have been previously used for discrimination. Uh, we got this morning already a rough overview. Uh, there's a, a bit more to say on side branches that did not, did not at all work out. Uh, then I will give my uh, version of the clinical translation of FCM, uh, somehow showing how this developed here starting in the basement of my institution, uh, working with some leftover rat preparation. Uh, I will then uh, introduce a new approach uh, that we have been developing since uh, two, three years now. Uh, that's a uh, light scatter spectroscopy. Uh, this is an approach uh, that um, looks very promising. Uh, it's kind of financially attractive. It's a very cheap technology. Uh, it can do potentially the same as we see with the FCM system. Uh, but to a fraction of the cost. Um, the project is advanced uh, somehow to the level of fixed uh, tissues. Uh, so there's still a long way to go, uh, hopefully not another 15 years. Uh, and I will end with some summary and conclusions. The yeah, motivation uh, here for this talk is uh, that uh, having imaging technology different uh, approaches to understand tissue distribution during surgery uh, promises to have uh, massive impacts on the outcomes uh, of uh, procedures. Uh, we spoke uh, here a lot about uh, pacemaker adaptation that we want to reduce this uh, by not damaging the tissue. The other direction that also covered to some degree is that um, uh, we might even expand more the reach of interest that a surgeon can consider uh, when we know where the conduction system is. There might be regions that are now available uh, after we know this is just atrial work myocardium uh, that were previously thought uh, to be not available because the conduction system resides there. Uh, these incomplete repairs uh, that uh, might result uh, here because someone is careful following the standard uh, can lead to adverse cardiac remodeling. Uh, that's a population of heart failure patients that shows them up uh, decades uh, later uh, that um, have not some more simple ways for treatment that are up uh, for transplantation. Uh, here we see uh, images produced uh, by us uh, uh, on two components of the cardiac production system. Uh, these are components that we focused initially, the sinus node and the AV node. Uh, what uh, you notice here is that uh, these structures are just beneath the surface uh, that we have access to, uh, but uh, they are not only in the top layers. Uh, the cells of the conduction system are somehow here 20, 30 micrometers beneath. Uh, same for the EV node. And that means also that we cannot see them with our eye. There's no way that we penetrate uh, even these superficial layers. Uh, this morning, the idea was uh, discussed to bring in functional dyes, uh, calcium or water sensitive dyes. Uh, while this would, in principle, work, uh, we will not be able to see it easily through these layers. Uh, there is just a, a kind of space uh, that our signal would drop off massively. massively. Uh, not that it's impossible, uh, but uh, it just makes this a, a way more a complex process. What you see from these images is uh, that the microstructure differs. Uh, obviously, uh, here for the white atrium or for the intervillar septum, uh, we have a much denser myocyte uh, distribution. Uh, in the nodal tissue, we see other cells, uh, but uh, also extracellular space, uh, interstitial space here, broadly expanded. Uh, and this is what uh, we use with our FCM system. Uh, that's where our dye uh, finally can diffuse. Uh, for other uh, approaches, this is not as much important uh, for electrical approaches. Uh, electric impedance approach to consider that uh, this is kind of more ample space that is available, there's better conductivity. Uh, the cells 
of the conduction system differ in their electrical activity. So they are not following the sequence of the neighboring tissue. And this allows them to assess them with uh, electrographic uh, methods. Uh, yeah, we published uh, in 2020 in review on what kind of approaches have been developed. Uh, we broke them down roughly in three different methods. Uh, one is a kind of electric impedance method um, uh, that was very early developed. Uh, what you do here is you bring in electrodes um, uh, that apply a current uh, and voltage method. And this gives you uh, an information about the electric impedance or resistivity of the tissue. Uh, when the conduction system is functional, when it still uh, sort of communicates uh, electrical signals, uh, an electrode can be used to measure uh, these signals. And this allows also here to get information uh, on where the conduction system resides. And the presentation this morning is so nicely this drop off. Uh, that's characteristic for electrical fields. So when you plug in a source in a specific location, uh, this is the uh, drop off uh, that uh, you would expect there. And then by optimizing the electrode position, you can somehow find the closest point uh, to the conduction system. Uh, a number of optical approaches have been developed. Uh, are in development and they are based on shining light in the tissue. Uh, then the tissue can be in itself fluorescent and you get a sun signal back. The tissue can scatter the light. This is also something that uh, you can collect. Or uh, what we've done with FCM, we bring in an artificial fluorophore. Uh, this artificial fluorophore is excited and then uh, the emitted light is collected. Uh, with FCM, this forms, allows an image formation. With other approaches, it might be just um, a signal similar to like an electrogram uh, or a spectroscopic uh, signal. Yeah, this is probably not the best way to present uh, uh, data that we've seen uh, much nicer presented uh, this morning in the uh, uh, But uh, I use the colors here to illustrate uh, somehow chronologically uh, what developments were performed. The first uh, EKG-based approach was uh, already done in the 1960s. Uh, that was uh, done in K9. Uh, in the subsequent years, uh, electrical impedance approaches uh, were applied and they even made it uh, here towards patients. Uh, but then it ends. And I think there are good reasons for this because um, you cannot expect that a, a simple measure like impedance uh, here, the drop of, uh, of the impedance can reliably identify uh, the nodal system. You saw this in the images before. Uh, you can somehow, if you're an electrical engineer, you can easily build your resistor networks in there uh, and then know already uh, here regions that it will fail when you get close to the and so on. Uh, the next Two decades, uh, starting 1960, were uh, somehow mostly uh, covered with EKG-based approaches. Uh, we learned this morning uh, why uh, it stopped at this time. One reason was um, uh, that cardioplegia was used in shut surgery and that shuts down uh, here also the conduction system. Uh, so these signals uh, that uh, we need here we cannot access them in a card of each card. Uh, the, uh, you would need a heart that is still beating. Uh, that's uh, where the electrical signaling works. Uh, yeah, it's good to see that uh, there's a kind of new branch now and uh, that uh, with new technology, these electrode arrays, they have not been available uh, at this time. Uh, but now they are, and uh, they uh, will really allow to move forward uh, with this direction. Uh, starting in 1990, uh, there were some attempts to measure fluorescence uh, of uh, tissue um, just based on UV light injection. Um, and this is, I think, also an approach uh, that is tough to, uh, to believe in uh, because uh, this is such a simple measure. It's like impedance uh, before. Here we know what kind of tissue is um, exhibit fluorophores, uh, we know that uh, when there is connective tissue independent of, uh, of a cardiac conduction system, 
this will show a high flow sense. Uh, there will be a lot of signal coming back. Uh, so it's not really surprising that um, these studies here were limited to fixed tissue variations from animals uh, and from human, uh, but uh, then uh, never made it here towards patients, uh, never made it even to uh, living animals. Elasticate, uh, we contributed uh, to this field. Uh, the first paper came out, uh, first large paper came out in uh, 2013. Uh, we held it before in 2009, a paper applying the FCM system uh, to cardiac system, but very unspecific at that time. Uh, and we needed um, uh, here some guidance to go in uh, interesting uh, direction. Uh, in 2019 and 20, uh, then our first um, uh, preclinical uh, and uh, clinical uh, results were published. Uh, I will dig a bit more in uh, into the FCM. Uh, I still think this is an emerging approach, uh, despite uh, what we've done. Uh, there is so much more that can be explored uh, with this approach. Uh, it can be translated uh, for other applications. Uh, just to give you a better understanding what this FCM allows you to do, what makes it different to just using a magnifying class uh, here to insert tray. Uh, here's a sketch for a standard uh, confocal microscope, not something that uh, we use in the OR, but the major difference is that we have the fiber. Uh, so what um, uh, these confocal microscopes uh, here do is they have a uh, a strong light source, typically a laser. Uh, this laser light is focused into the tissue. Uh, and uh, then the expectation is that there are flow of force. Uh, those can be native. Uh, uh, collagen is a good flow of force, for instance. Uh, but um, in most applications, uh, fluorescent dyes are used. I've actually introduced uh, what dye we are preferring because it's an FDA approved uh, dye, at least for some applications. So when we assume now that uh, at this location, there is this flow for it will be excited, and then it will emit light of a longer wavelength. Commonly, uh, this uh, light is then collected via the same uh, optical elements and uh, goes towards the detector. This can be a photomultiplier, this can be a camera. Uh, we can move here the focus point uh, electronically. Um, and uh, somehow form an image. So this can be very rapidly done. Uh, some of the newest systems uh, that are in the, in the lab world uh, uh, get uh, repetition rates here of up to one kilohertz. Uh, now, uh, for the system that uh, we are using, we are in the 10 hertz uh, range. Uh, that's close enough uh, here to get enough repetition. Uh, yeah, the. Only difference now with the uh, clinical system that we had used is that uh, in between here, the objective uh, and the dichroic mix of mirror, there is a specific uh, fiber, a fiber uh, array, uh, a bundle of fibers. Uh, so that detaches uh, the systems and that allows them all to make this very flexible to bring the probe uh, to the patient. Uh, with standard confocus, despite it has been established now since decades in the lab, uh, this would not be possible. Yeah, you've seen this system uh, before. That's the second generation. Uh, we had uh, the first generation in the lab as well. Uh, this is the one uh, that uh, combines everything in a box uh, that is for clinical usage. Uh, for us, initially, uh, we uh, were interested in optimizing the imaging properties. Uh, we wanted to uh, find out here what's the right lens uh, that needs to be attached uh, to this film. Uh, we uh, had uh, quite a number of choices uh, here. Uh, what uh, we settled in for our small animal studies were at around 30 micrometers focal depth uh, for uh, the human studies now around 60 micrometers. Uh, the company, uh, they somehow provide uh, here is different depth uh, for a number of our studies. We got kind of failures in their production um, and they helped us then to uh, achieve uh, the working distance uh, that we wanted uh, for our animals. Uh, it's also possible to trust image uh, here at the surface. 
uh, and get Microsoft information there, but uh, clearly this would not be instructive. Uh, the surface layer that's uh, endothelium uh, or uh, epicard, there is not, there's no information present that uh, would give us uh, the conduction system. Uh, these uh, fibers can be up to 10 meters long. Uh, in clinical use, uh, be uh, around uh, two, three meters. Yeah, our original idea is illustrated here. Uh, that uh, is when we thought of a kind of traffic light system. Uh, we have our nodal tissue structure. Uh, we have our working myocard tissue structure, and uh, we say um, here red and green light for procedures. Uh, you saw the next steps uh, in this. That's the clock phase, uh, way more advanced. Um, uh, this was um, somehow just point-wise. Uh, the ideas that you saw communicate this morning expand this to a measuring mapping approach. I think this is what uh, uh, somehow here will be valuable. Uh, it's important to outline uh, a region of interest, not just uh, point-wise, uh, but uh, somehow get an overview over several square millimeters uh, to find out where components of the conduction uh, system are. I was already before alluded on this. Uh, it's not so easy to hold such a probe uh, in your hand. Um, I cannot do it even before coffee. Uh, I think the images uh, that uh, I produce when I hold it by hand look like the intro to uh, Star Trek and just, just see something flying uh, left and right. Um, uh, that was initially a concern if we need something that uh, mechanically stabilizes. Um, here, these probes, uh, but then it turned out uh, that uh, there is precision uh, here in the hands of a surgeon in this field, and um, uh, it uh, is possible to get stable images uh, so that they're useful and perfectly stable, uh, but um, uh, you somehow can draw conclusions based uh, on the microstructure uh, here by handheld probes. Uh, we started in this project uh, with a uh, rodent studies. Uh, uh, these are 3D reconstructions uh, that we performed uh, of uh, regions uh, in the heart. And uh, these images helped us to understand in which depth uh, the tissue of interest is. Uh, it, uh, so here you see the uh, epicard uh, or endocardial uh, layer. So when we're interested in getting to the muscle structures for working myocard, but also conduction system, uh, we need to go beneath. And this is where the confocal really does its job. Uh, we, cannot, uh, we can go into the depth. We are not uh, here just going on the surface. The exocellar marker that you see here, uh, it's uh, fundamentally different because it binds, but it does produce the same signal as uh, the fluoride that is used in the clinical studies, uh, a difference between these images and uh, what uh, the fiber optics produces clearly is with that resolution. Uh, this is a, a high resolution confocal microscope. Uh, we get sub micrometer uh, resolution. Uh, and uh, the FCM system is uh, just an order of magnitude uh, here above. And you see also a nuclei uh, labeled in blue. Uh, that's uh, the arrangement of the myocytes and then a marker uh, here uh, for the myocytes. Uh, that's a protein that's found at the ends of the sarcomere, characteristic for myocytes. And uh, below you see the 3D reconstruction turning. And uh, this gives you an idea. We need to penetrate here into the depth uh, to get the information of interest. Uh, same here for the nodal tissue, that sinus node, uh, AV node, uh, did uh, look in rodent very, very similar. Uh, we used a, a marker uh, to confirm uh, that this is a nodal tissue. Uh, here in rodent, uh, the nodal tissue is a bit more on the surface uh, than what we uh, saw later in human uh, and in ovine. Uh, but uh, this reticular pattern that uh, you see here uh, you have these openings uh, with uh, uh, plenty of fibroblasts uh, here uh, located in between. That's characteristic. That's what we saw in all species uh, confirmed. Uh, so instead of a nicely striated pattern, uh, we have this reticular pattern. And this is what we 
used as a concept uh, then to move forward uh, uh, towards uh, human. Yeah, the images do not look as great here as on my computer, but uh, these were the first uh, rodent images. Um, uh, very quickly, we uh, use software to uh, analyze these structures, uh, somehow to go away from just the visual impression of someone who looks at these images, uh, but to produce numbers. Uh, is this striated? Is it regular? Or is it irregular, as we see here on the right-hand side? Uh, the number of approaches uh, that uh, did this with high quality, and these are Fourier-based approaches. Uh, in recent work, we used also convolutional neural networks uh, that uh, can do this. Uh, it's not a complicated task. Uh, for a computer, it's also not a complicated task for a surgeon to discriminate uh, in the majority of cases, uh, at least here. Uh, so we got here very high uh, sensitivity and specificity already in the early studies and that was then translated uh, later uh, for the human. Uh, this was my perspective on the translation. Uh, so for me, it started uh, when I think the shortest uh, instrument, successful instrumentation can't uh, uh, that I ever wrote worked out. Uh, I submitted one sentence. Uh, I would like to have a fiber optics confocal microscope to our department. And uh, then uh, it showed up. It was originally in a wrong lab. Uh, it went to a colleague's lab, but he couldn't use it at all. Uh, and then at one point, it went uh, to our labs. Uh, we got uh, very quickly a, a paper out showing that this is useful for a human, uh, that uh, we uh, can image uh, here cardiac microstructure uh, with such a fiber optic system. Uh, we uh, got then a, a kind of smaller grant from the NIH uh, to move forward in a small animal model. Uh, this led to a paper in a kind of prestigious journal uh, for this field. Uh, then it needed several attempts uh, to get the NIH grants. Uh, it's um, somehow, yeah, I think it was one three uh, that uh, we, we need uh, three attempts here to get it. Uh, but uh, then uh, it uh, went through and uh, we were able to somehow do the uh, preclinical work and mobile model before transitioning uh, to the human work. Uh, we completed uh, here based on the processes that I just illustrated uh, here a clinical trial phase one and uh, uh, currently, somewhere at the end uh, of the uh, phase two uh, clinical trial, Optima, uh, that uh, somehow will be the highlight uh, then of uh, the work in the last uh, close to 15 years. Yeah, I will now you show you some uh, another idea on uh, tissue discrimination, uh, what kind of technologies uh, can be applied. Uh, this is a technology uh, that uh, we feel could do something similar, uh, could be easier to apply. Uh, it uh, somehow is from the investment uh, order of magnitude smaller, uh, very likely. Uh, what uh, we developed uh, here is a system uh, that uh, uses a broadband uh, light source. Uh, it works with uh, optical fibers. Uh, it shines them this light in the tissue. Uh, the tissue then scatters the light. Uh, it absorbs, uh, so it's not crucial, but uh, we get light back uh, due to scattering. And then we have uh, two spectrometers uh, that uh, somehow sense the backscattered light at different distances. Uh, so with this approach, we would get two different spectra. Uh, in the first paper, we showed uh, that uh, the spectra are fundamentally different for different tissue types. Uh, it's not that... Um, when we shine light on some tissue, uh, that uh, we would expect that these spectra are uh, similar. Here you see spectra from uh, myocardium in red and from the water uh, in blue. Uh, they differ uh, in the magnitude, but there are also further features uh, that are characteristic uh, for this tissue type. Uh, we explored then arrangements uh, that we felt uh, <laughs> uh, that we felt uh, reflect the cardiac tissue distribution. Uh, we produced them by sectioning tissue, stacking it. 
so we produced a number of stacks that's part of the study. Uh, overall, we had, uh, I think, 20 different variants. Uh, then we used the LSS system to probe uh, here, what like comes back. Uh, we performed these studies uh, multiple, multiple times and then trained a neural network. So we took part of the data for training and then uh, another part for the evaluation. And this helped us to identify how to arrange our detection fibers and how many detection fibers are important uh, here to end up with specific accuracies. I will not explain too much on kind of standard approaches in machine learning, uh, how to evaluate uh, classification results, but uh, the accuracy that we obtained here uh, with a specific combination of fibers uh, was uh, around 84%. Uh, so uh, with 84% accuracy, it can discriminate between these different tissue arrangements. Uh, so that was for us a motivation to move forward a kind of a proof of principle. In the next paper, we uh, expanded this uh, towards the detection of nuclear density. Uh, nuclear density changes in different tissue types. Uh, in fibrotic tissues, it's very high because there are many small fibroblasts. Uh, in myocard, it's commonly uh, small because there are these large myocytes uh, with a, a, a small number of nuclei uh, in them. So here we had tissues uh, where we knew that uh, this nuclear density is widely spread. Uh, this was our input data. Uh, we used the same system as just described uh, and then applied machine learning approaches, cluster analysis, but also neural network uh, here for classification. Uh, to find out how accurate we get uh, with a nuclear detection. Uh, this is uh, the uh, probe uh, that uh, we applied. Uh, uh, that's a photo of it. So in the center, you see the illumination fiber. Uh, then you see some detection fibers uh, towards the side. Um, I think this was produced uh, not too far from here. Oh, where? Yeah, so that was made by Berkshire Photonics and Washington Depot, Connecticut. So, some hundred kilometers or yeah. Well, the first one was, well, I don't know. Yeah, so this is uh, some of the probe uh, that uh, we applied. Uh, it has five fibers, one generation, uh, two detection fibers, very different to the FCM system that has 30,000 fibers. Uh, uh, the costs here for these probes are marginal. Uh, here for nuclear detection, uh, we uh, showed an accuracy of 95% to detect ranges. So we had here a range with a small density, middle density, and high density of nuclei. Again, this is a kind of proof of principle. Uh, this approach uh, does what we wanted to do it. Uh, we, we know uh, that we can detect changes of the structure. We also can get depth, uh, <clears throat> depth resolution. Uh, that was the prior slide on. So these are all the ingredients uh, that would be necessary if moving forward here uh, with the cardio conduction system. Okay, I'm already at the end uh, with my presentation. I gave you an overview of uh, what kind of technologies have been developed, uh, what uh, might be in the pipeline uh, here. Uh, I found it very interesting to see how early people worked already in this field, uh, that it also ended very early. Um, uh, somehow identifying also branches that did not lead to a result. And um, uh, I think now from our perspective, this is easy because we understand microstructure much better than uh, 60 years ago. Uh, we know much more about optical properties of the tissues, electric properties. Uh, this was all not so understood uh, when uh, uh, some of the previous, or close to two generations back, we worked on electrical impedance measurements. Uh, I showed you how we translated uh, here uh, some optical technology. Um, we started with small animals, we moved them to mid-sized animals, uh, and then it went to the clinical trials. Uh, these clinical trials, uh, they are also kind of a stacked uh, for showing safety and uh, showing uh, efficacy. Uh, with optical approaches, uh, there is a lot 
going on. And I think the next uh, presenter will uh, follow up on this and show what's cutting edge uh, in this field. Uh, but uh, there's a lot to expect. Uh, the technology is rapidly developing. It's also some cost, cost points. Uh, these spectrometers, uh, they are now so much less expensive, cameras are much less expensive uh, than a decade ago. It's uh, one of the biomedical or physical, biophysical field that uh, really is uh, progressing very rapidly. Uh, I also think I stressed it enough here, machine learning is playing a major role uh, in these developments. A number of uh, the analysts that were initially not straightforward, uh, they are now much more simplified because um, in the last 10 years, machine learning, all the different neural networks that have been developed, uh, the uh, hardware supported, um, there's uh, the big software libraries out. Uh, this is uh, really facilitating analysis that were previously not thought of. And uh, for instance, for spectroscopic data, there's never hope that the engineer or cardiac surgeon looks at them and uh, finds out uh, this is a tissue type. Uh, we will need some sophisticated uh, analysis uh, and uh, clearly machine learning is uh, then the way to go. I have also a lengthy list of uh, people who were involved over uh, the years. Uh, yeah, we have uh, currently a number of undergrads uh, working here with respect to machine learning. Uh, the first work was uh, done by Richard uh, Lesher. Uh, he was the first student to uh, export this in the heart. Uh, but then we had several brilliant students uh, here over the years who moved this uh, forward. Uh, to the stage uh, that it is now. Yeah, I, also, I think, uh, Eke, you know how important uh, it was that this work is done here at uh, the best place uh, uh, for the clinical translation. Uh, it uh, needs a kind of highly motivated person to drive this. Uh, uh, we had uh, a lot of help by the developer of the FCR system. Um, some of our initial studies in animals, uh, when we explored the system, they would have not moved forward without uh, their support. I think now we are in the mainstream equipment uh, from them. Uh, they somehow, um, the probes uh, that uh, we are now using, uh, they are uh, also used for other applications. They're not special uh, for the heart. And uh, yeah, the number of grants uh, came here over the years. Uh, it was not just uh, the NIH, uh, it was also American Heart. Uh, the University of Houston, Utah, uh, supported uh, these uh, developments. And uh, I did not list the grants here at BCH, but uh, this will probably double uh, uh, then uh, this list. Okay, that's it. Thank you.